Um, so today, today I get the privilege of introducing the Black Solidarity Think Tank Group. And over the past five development days, so two years, and I was thinking about that as the pandemic, the time that we've been through the pandemic, but they've been working before that. Um, the, the BSTT has been crucial in curating an excellent group of guest speakers focused on racial equity, resulting in important conversations and reflections. They have also developed a framework to guide us towards systems and culture change on campus where Black lives are centered at all levels of our praxis. Today, they will share with us their thoughts over the last two years and how we continue to build individually and collectively. I personally want to thank all the members of the Black Solidarity Think Tank group for their work, dedication, and commitment. Welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna um, start us off um, by um, pointing out our, our title for uh, this session coming and that it's everybody's business um, because it is. We normally hear it's nobody's business, but it is everybody's business. Um, that's our title. Um, and in this slide, you'll see uh, words in this um, that really speak to the values of what um, we've been wanting to get to and, and, and we know we're getting to. So we know that Guided Pathways um, requires um, a, a radical transformation of what we do, how we do it. It requires response and commitment to the work, uh, to dismantling policies, procedures that you know continue perpetuating um, inequalities. So out of that work, um, one of our meetings, we sat there and we were discussing how do we move this uh, sort of needle forward so that we are congruent with our roots. And I recall Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly and Dr. Helena having a very intriguing conversation that we were all on the edge of our seats and um, really speaking to the need to be rooted in our identity as central in our identity of activism, um, anti-racism work. Um, and in that meeting, we, I asked, and, and Kate reminded me as I was talking to her about this yesterday, um, we needed to pause because at that moment in time, we began this journey to figure out how to make those changes real for us, how to put into practice this radical change. And the BSTT was formed at that very moment. Um, knowing that we needed to do some heavy lifting and work. Um, it was pretty impressive, um, this moment. Um, we had to take a moment of just pausing and recognizing the importance of it. Right there and then, we knew that we needed to change the culture of the college by creating um, a framework um, that would be the sort of foundation and the work um, and the work that we were doing through uh, Pathways. We had to practice uh, racial um, equity and uh, anti-racist work. Uh, and that, that was the, the need that we needed to, to see take place. So the presentation today um, began with that uh, fervent and desire to make sure that we were not just doing uh, work that would not be lasting, but work that would be really um, being part of, of everything, how we looked at the college, the culture change, and so that it becomes everybody's business, um, that we're not uh, going to ask that people sit um, idly by, but to really understand because this work is going to, in moving forward, be our, our principle, our, our, the very thing that just, um, it's, Part of the fabric of the of the college, and it's and it's um, what we know will need to take place in order for us to be successful in working with our students and having them be successful in getting through. Um, so next slide. So today, um, and I hope I've done justice to 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 that moment because it was indeed a very deep and and, and significant moment. So today uh, we're going to cover in this next uh, few minutes. Um, the work that is rooted in the history of social justice and racial equity. We're going to 
talk about uh, the nourished wisdom of the keynote speakers and how that all plays into the work and how that helped really provide some of that um, foundation work, um, spreading our branches through praxis, you know, how is this gonna work? What were our expectations are discovering the forest transformation change uh, because that's what we know we need to do is, you know, be change uh, for the sake of, of uh, doing the good work. Um, it is going to be part of who we are. So without further um, discussion, I wanna bring in Sharon who will uh, begin um, our discussion discussion and presentation. Mute. Thank you, Ricardo. Now I'm on You're mute. You're very welcome. And I can also do the slides. So I wanted to just, I'm working with the rooted in a history of social justice and racial equity. And here are two blasts from the past of Seattle Central College what used to be Seattle Community College and then Seattle Central Community College. So 1969, we've had um, action where the Black Student Union did, um, staged a sit-in demanding equitable distribution of operating budget. Hmm, sound familiar? And also um, curriculum that would be they wanted to make sure that curriculum was distributed across all three campuses. They didn't want this kind of tracking system where one campus was, which was central, was going to be only focused on developmental remedial type of curriculum. So they did a sit in to ask for that. And the result was there was a black studies curriculum that was established. And we also hired African American faculty, administrators, and a trustee. Then in 1971, we had the Oriental Student Union follow the lead of the Black Student Union and they also staged a sit-in that closed the admin building because they were protesting the lack of Asian American administrators. And we see in the photograph, you see the labels, um, the student Alan Sugiyama was addressing the crowd as they were doing in the midst of that protest. And the result of that sit-in was Asian American curriculum was added to the college, as well as Asian American faculty and administrators. And those are just two examples of how students have come together to raise their voices and say, hell no, <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is not right. We need to do something about this and we're going to speak up. So that um, culture of activism is, has been a part of us for years. And over the years, the community of Seattle Central has engaged in a variety of causes. Okay, I need to move my own slides. And on the left, you'll see a, a list of some of the things that have come into play throughout the years, you know, the 60s and 70s, the anti-war movement, the women's rights movement, police brutality, 80s, I mean, it's been going on forever. LGBTQ rights. We have um, causes related to the Patriot Act that led to Islamophobia. We have speakers come in, um, students rise up. So just an example, just a sample of some of the issues that have come into play where not just students, but faculty administrators have come together to say, no, we are not going to take this. We need to do something about this. And I've listed on the right-hand side, some of the actions that we've had between the student run newspaper and um, the conciliation project that was spearheaded by our beloved Dr. Tanya Pettiford Waits. Um, there's just many different ways that we have come together to say, no, this, this needs to change. We've had teach-ins, we've had rallies, we've had marches, there's journalism, there's letter writing, there's stuff happening in the classroom, stuff happening in meeting rooms, stuff happening in the hallways, at the fountain, the Sutakawa fountain, we've had rallies to preserve that. We've had stuff happen in the library and of course the South Lawn, and it's not just on our campus. We also have our students, our college community, come together and speak up down at City Hall and then at the state capitol. So we've been in this for a while. And so you might say, 
well, is this, is this guided pathways thing going to be like some of these other initiatives that have come into our college campus and then what happened to them? We say, no, we don't see the guided pathways as such a thing like a, a kind of fad in education. We see it as something that builds on previous work that we've done. Um, we see it as being a movement towards sustainability, sustainable transformation. That's what we see this guided pathways as. And we see it as a movement that's going to center um, equity and care and bring some cohesion to all these uh, the work that we've done in the past and work that's coming. We want to make sure that the work is cohesive, that it's centered, that it's grounded in one, one cause, which is equity and care. We don't want to have a repeat where we experience these siloed types of initiatives and projects, or even the ones, the disappearing initiatives and projects. We want to have the initiatives and projects be like, that was then, now we're in a movement, we're all in this together. This is truly everybody's business. And if we're all involved, we are all on the same page. We're doing work in different areas, but at the same time, we're also aware of what other folks are doing. And we know that we're all in this for a common cause. So that's what the Guided Pathways movement is hoping to accomplish through the framework, the foundation of the Black Solidarity Think Tank. And so I'm going to turn it over to Desiree, who will give you a little bit more detail on how the speakers that we've had so far connect with the foundation of Black Solidarity Think Tank. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm honored to join you as a member of uh, the Black Solidarity Think Tank and a member of Seattle Central's uh, community. I've got the easy job today to reacquaint everyone with the guest speakers that we've had um, through the Black Solidarity Think Tank and um, Guided Pathways. And um, we chose these speakers and, and you can find all the information in uh, and the canvas, the old canvas course shells, the modules, um, where we highlight all the speakers that we've had and clips. Um, and thank you, Michaela, and um, lots of information about them. So I'm just gonna give you a, a brief overview in the order that they have appeared um, at our development days. Um, and keep in mind that these speakers were all chosen uh, very pointedly. Uh, for their expertise, but as well as how they have this sort of big commitment to care and research and really like grounding us and holding us in this institutional thinking that we have to transform not just ourselves, but the spaces that we're in and the people that we work with um, and how we think about all of that. So first in the fall of 2020, we had Dr. Derek Brooms. And Derek, uh, Dr. Brooms' message to us focused on ways we see our work through the lens of black males um, as we do all this institutional work, uh, this work in our jobs, um, this work in our lives, and this work out in the halls at Central. Um, Dr. Brooms talked a lot about uh, improving and transforming our learning environments, um, and also our praxis. Our praxis. Um, for me, Dr. Brooms was particularly compelling um, is in our connection to Guided Pathways because Central, you know, you saw Sharon's part, Central has this huge legacy um, and all of this historical uh, background for being at the forefront of this work and, and sort of, um, focusing on how we try to see our institution as a way um, that certain groups of individuals, particularly Black males, experience our institution 
um, is vital. It's vital to data. It's vital to, um, you know, how we look at how people move in our halls and what they experience through our faculty members and through staff. And um, Dr. Brooms really sort of um, encapsulated this for us. In the winter of 2021, we had Dr. Billy Sankofa Waters and um, Dr. Waters grounded her work in black feminism and critical race theory and as did all of our speakers. Um, Dr. Waters' uh, Development Day work enlightened how we can deepen our understanding of identity, intersectionality, and positionality by engaging in personal reflection and poetic storytelling, um, which is the ground, it's the groundwork of BSTT. Um, her presentation was particularly powerful because she has such a personal connection um, to folks at Central, including Dr. Livingston and Dr. McCray. And that was really cool to see how far back they go and, you know, with their with dissertations. And um, so it, it's, it's odd for me, it's odd to, you know, people I've cited like Dr. Waters to be physical in our, to physically be in our spaces is really cool. And to see um, the impact that Dr. Waters has had on people at Central. In the spring of 2021, we had Dr. Frank Harris III, and um, our choice to have uh, Dr. Harris join us was to sort of deal with some great historical context around the concepts of equity and equity-mindedness. We throw these words around, um, and, and Dr. Harris sort of said like, let's rein this back in a little bit and let's refocus on institutional equity um, because you know a, a decade ago this wasn't even a thing um, and and at some colleges and institutions equity and equity mindedness remains this elusive thing that we can't get hold of um, so Dr. Harris talked about how some efforts institutionally are done piecemeal and offered ways that we could see uh, impact and not scattered impact. Um, and we know this well at Central. Um, and we know that the work of BSTT and, and Guided Pathways, we're trying to daylight that and, and change that and transform. Um, the fall of 2021, we had Nzinga Dugas, and um, Dugas addressed creating academic and social experiences that provide uh, nurturing and necessary environments for Black students to succeed. And Dugas's work is particularly salient to Central and the work of Pathways because she laid out this work as being not just part of our work, but being this really personal thing to all of us and personal in our lives and our experiences with students and our practices and personal to the work of our, our souls, like, you know, how we feel better about our days and how we feel better about um, how we impact students and how we impact our colleagues, but what personal impact that has to us. Um, you guys talk, talked a lot about um, how campus leaders can and must learn transformative methods that directly address how to shift structural and systemic practices that negatively impact student success, um, again, which is another part of the role of BSTT. And um, FYI, um, Nzinga Dugas is an executive uh, for the Emoja community and the fall of 2022 will be the start of Seattle Central's first Emoja Scholars Program cohort. Um, and we could not be more excited to have something like that at Central with our legacy. Um, and, the work of BSTT is really, you know, we're, we're really, we're holding on to this uh, program tightly um, and we're really, really excited about it. 
Um, I will put that link in the chat uh, after I finish this last one. So lastly, in the winter of 2022, we had Dr. Paul Gorski. And Gorski was actually a surprise to me because I had read some of his previous work and used it in my, um, in the English, in my English shell for second language learners. Um, so it was pretty amazing to put a face to some of the uh, writing that I was reading. And Gorski met with BSTT prior to development day. And that conversation was so raw and so telling. And, and um, we really sort of understood how important our work was. We understood it a long time ago, but having someone who isn't necessarily from our experience sort of validate that work um, was big. Um, and Gorski also, also personalized this work for us. And Dr. Gorski's presentation focused on racial battle fatigue and burnout and also compassion fatigue, um, which we all are experiencing now, especially uh, BIPOC faculty. Um, and Gorski highlighted the growing body of research in demonstrating how people committed to racial justice and how people who are committed to racial justice are especially susceptible um, to experiences of burnout and battle fatigue. Um, he spoke directly to how this anti-racism work impacts us and what happens in this, in this process and what the price of exhaustion um, is and how sometimes it creates a disconnect from our work um, and from the community when this work is so personal. Um, then we had a return, uh, a workshop by Dr. Gorski which, Gorski, which culminated in a discussion about how we sustain momentum um, and avoid all the things that cause like institutional harm and invisible harm. And, um, you know, and th those are the speakers we've had so far. And I'll, I'll end this by saying that we really keep in mind speakers that we use for development day. Um, and of course, I forgot my last slide. I see it on the screen, um, that connection between the speakers. We, we keep in mind that uh, critical race theory is at the heart of so much of this work. And uh, the slide sort of in a very bizarre PowerPoint way um, refocuses how that is the basis, CRT is the basis for a lot of this thinking and how each of the speakers that we've had so far um, feed into that information as we go through this uh, framework. Um, so that's me. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start my timer. I talk too much. So hi, everyone. Cal, let's sail. Um, the um, he, him, we, us pronouns, um, acting vice president of student services, as well as the dean of student success. Uh, so before I go into this slide, I, I want to share a quote with you that really resonated with me uh, as far as like who I feel like I am. So I was at a Guided Pathways uh, Summit and Dr. Tia McNair shared this quote. So she wrote the book, uh, from equity walk to equity talk. And the, the quote is, before you can transform systems and structures, you must do the people work first. So for me, the people work is, you know, something that I think I need to operationalize. For me, it really points to the healing pedagogy that's part of the BSTT framework. So what I'm gonna share is my experience going through the process of applying the Black Solidarity Think Tanks framework. Um, so what is this people work? Uh, that's something that I think, you know, oftentimes it's not described enough. And what you have here is a passage from Resma Manikam's book, uh, My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma. And I think it gets at it pretty darn well. Um, so I'm gonna read a, a few excerpts. Uh, Culture is how our bodies re retain and reenact history change culture and you change lives. You also change the course of history. 
Many well-meaning social activists overlook this essential fact. They focus relentlessly on strategy, but strategy means nothing to our bodies and lizard brains. When strategy competes with culture, culture wins every time. This is one of the reasons why the most brilliant anti-white supremacy strategies in the world have failed to dislodge white body supremacy from our culture. So uh, hopefully this resonated with you as well as far as why this people work. You know, I don't believe it's an either or, it needs to be both and. I think Dr. McCray and I are, came up with this other term, and, and. Uh, so as we think about all these changes that we know we need to make, uh, what we can't forget is this people work, this culture building. Um, and for us in student services, we're calling it, calling it the beloved community. Uh, so if you can move on to the next slide. Uh, so if I can take a step back, I just want to acknowledge, you know, the, the, the work of our uh, much esteemed president, uh, Dr. Yoshiko Hardin, for all the work she put in to lay the groundwork for this to happen. And even though I'm the one that's talking, I want everyone to know this is not Cal doing everything by himself. Uh, the student services staff have been so awesome as far as being vulnerable and willing to step up, courageous and uh, willing to you know, be okay with tension and conflict and sharing it with me and others as far as like where, where, where we should grapple with some of these terms a little bit more. So this is not a Cal thing, this has been like, a lot of folks, so Diane Coleman, Ricardo Leiva Puebla, and my Mostad. So they all played a key role. Okay, so what you read here is the student services vision. So I'm gonna read it real quick. That this is so this is what where we landed on. It's a living statement, it will it can change. So in student services, we are a beloved community committed to learning, empowerment, and transformation of students and all those in our community. Through this, we honor our college's history of fighting for racial equity and social justice. So as you're hearing this, hopefully there's a few words that's kind of catching your attention. So hopefully beloved is one of those. Um, so what I wanna share with you is the process as far as how we got to this point. If I had enough time to do a poll, I would probably poll you. Um, so, Hopefully, if you had to guess, you'll say like, you know, it might take you one, two meetings. Uh, so it took, the process took an academic year. So this is the walk that I talk about with my staff as far as engaging in this collective, walking through this people process and engaging really, you know, with this framework, looking at the literature, our own experience and really grappling with some of these terms. So here's, I'll describe kind of what we did just so you all have an idea as far as like, the amount of work that it takes to engage in the culture building or the people process. Uh, so what we did was in this, this past summer, we had Dr. Derek Brooms come by and meet with our student services council. So that's all the directors as well as our um, uh, staff from our uh, faculty counselor liaison. Uh, we met to talk about for us in student services, why do we do our work? And if we look at the body or the culmination of our work, what are the results of that work? So in, after one meeting, we're like, well, we need a little bit more time to grapple with this. Because if we want to draft a vision, um, we're still not too clear as far as our why and the purpose. So we asked Dr. Brooms to come back again for our fall department time. All the directors, deans, and the VP, we sat together and had another meeting. Uh, after that meeting, we met with, um, Student Services Council, again, to kind of show our initial draft of the vision. After that meeting, we got some feedback. We came back again over winter quarter and met with all of student services at our department time. We got even more feedback. One of the things that we felt like we need to, needed to really unpack was this term beloved. You know, for us, it's not a happy, happy, joy, joy all the time term. It's about going against the grain. I love that term that uh, Dr. Hunt has shared. It's about going ag against the grain, being able to be in conflict with the other staff or other student while still being able to work it out. Conflict is okay. That's actually how we become better or do better. So for us, that was what we meant by beloved. Um, so that was winter quarter. We shared it with all the student services, got even more feedback. In between that, I met with every department. We did readings, we read bell hooks, 
We listened to uh, Francisca Maxime, a podcast with Bruce Perry. We read even more readings, even more readings, more discussions, talked about our experience. And then finally, we landed out on this vision. Is it perfect? Maybe. <laughs> Can it be better? Is it, uh, you know, and that's one of the things where I think that's part of the people process. It doesn't have to be perfect. Some of you might say, well, you know, is that really a vision? I'll say, well, for me, it doesn't matter because I worked with my team on it. And that's what matters. So for me, that's the culture building. That's the people process. So for that has been where, you know, this morning we rolled it out again as far as this is our vision. Uh, I'm going to ask my staff to kind of put in their signature line. And then for this next year, we're going to keep refining it. We're going to look at operationalizing from this vision. Can we pull out some of the values? And then can we operationalize it? So I'm sharing that to say that this is a, for me, I always use the word, this never ending process. It's a process of renewal. We can't think we hit this spot and it's done and everybody's going to be magically, students are magically going to be better. So for, for us, this beloved community is this constant process of renewal, requires us to look at this framework that the BSTT has provided and really grappling with like tough problems of practice is what I like to call it. So that's the student services, acting DP stuff that I did. Um, Sharon, if you can move into the next slide. I timed myself, I have two minutes. Okay, so when I stepped into the Dean of Student Success role, I took the same philosophy as far as culture building, systems and structure. And I said, okay, well, I have a trio running start advising underneath me. What do we need to do? The first thing was culture build. And what we grappled with, and it took about a year, uh, was this question, what does it take to make a healthy community for students and staff? And we pulled on the healing pedagogy uh, literature. We, as a group, for every uh, PDD, we as a group met together to, to answer that question. So for that group, what we did was a little different in that we actually identified what it actually looks like at the ground level, and that's the bullet points. And then from the bullet points, what we did was we extracted the value kind of statement. So that took about a year to create this document. It's actually two pages, single spaced. Uh, if you wanna see it, I can share it with all of you. Um, and this is a document where for every new staff that went, that we onboarded or hired as far as like student success, I would say, welcome to the central family and the student success family. Here's a document that we wrote. I need you to make time to read it because it's important as far as how we will work together. And it's gonna be how we hold each other accountable because um, it starts with us. So that's one document. So that's the first year. And Sharon, if you can move to the next slide. So the second year, what we did was we pulled on uh, Dr. Frank Harris and Luke Wood's uh, literature as far as they had an awesome, awesome webinar around the seven equity-minded practices. Uh, for me, there were themes. So we spent the whole year saying, okay, what makes, uh, what, what is equity-minded advising? for all three years. Okay, I'm, my time is up, but I'm gonna keep going. Sorry, y'all, y'all put me first. <laughs> so we, we answered that question as far as student success. So we drafted this document and said, okay, here are the themes. What are our current practices and what are our future practices? So that's not what you're seeing here. We spent a year drafting that document. And after that year, what we did was in my past meeting with my directors and a recent meeting with my directors, we said, okay, what's the next step that we need to take? So we took that document and created this one that says, okay, if these are the practices that we want to implement, how are we gonna assess ourselves to say, if, we, that we're, if, if we're actually accomplishing what we wanna accomplish? So this is the people work um, as far as far as the student success work, that's roughly two years to do the culture building, and it still needs to be built. Uh, the other piece that you know I, don't, I didn't really get a chance to talk about is there's this awesome mural, having imagery with a story behind it. I keep asking my staff, share the story. It talks about the Orient, Oriental Student Club. So hopefully this gives you all a, a lot of ideas as far as like how you can take the Black Solidarity Think Tank and apply it to your work. Because it's not one size fits all. There's no silver bullet. 
But the key is, you know, I, I told my staff this, uh, there's no point where we're ready. We just have to do it now. So when it comes to this culture building work, because if we don't, if you could move to the next slide, Sharon, I'm sorry, BSCT, I'm almost done. If we don't, this is gonna be what's gonna happen. And I love this quote by uh, Baldwin. I can't believe what you say that the song goes because I see what you do. Because if we don't align what the inner self as far as like our work, our actions with our heart and mind, I've worked with students that's been disenfranchised, marginalized and oppressed. They will see through what you say and dissect your actions to say, okay, well, you may have been able to help me graduate and get, get me the service, but at the end of the day, I don't trust you. So they're not any better off. So I love this quote. Sorry, BSCT, I took too much time. I'm gonna pass it on to the next one. Thanks, Cal. I'll try to be brief so the other folks can go. So I just would like to talk about how the counseling faculty here at Seattle Central um, infuse um, uh, some of the work that the BSTT has done into our counseling work. So one of the things that happened uh, last spring was that we participated in a professional development activity called Brick Book Reading Inquiry Circle. And this activity was initiated by one of our, our counselors, Ruby Hansra, and she brought us all along because we have been talking since uh, January about how to infuse intersectionality and critical race theory in a more meaningful way throughout our work with students, including our teaching, our workshops, and more importantly, our counseling practices. As a group, we were we we conducted formal conversations, like I said, since uh, uh, January. We've been having these conversations for a long time. Next slide. However, before we really sat down and um, had real deep conversations, we had to decide on some articles, right? So I was asked to like initiate a couple of articles, which I did, and these were some of the articles that I selected as a point, a starting point for us to have these conversations that we were gonna have. And we read these articles to inform what actions we would um, take to dismantle those inequities in our classes, in our workshops, and most importantly, in our counseling practices. So the first article we read was Geraldo Payne's The Role of Critical Race Theory in Education. And just a brief synopsis, this article analyzes the role of race and racism and, per and perpetrating social disparities between dominant and marginalized groups. And the purpose, understanding that the purpose of CRT is always to unearth what is taken for granted when analyzing race and privilege, as well as the profound patterns of exclusion that exist in society. The next article was Other Mothering as a Framework for Understanding African-American Students' Definitions of Student-Centered Faculty. So in this qualitative study, African-American students attending a predominantly white institution, PWI, were interviewed to understand their definitions of student-centered faculty. The results suggest that a tradition of education within the African community called other mothering provides a useful framework for conceptualizing the unique needs and expectations of some of our African American students. Um, we also read uh, Tariaso's article, Dr. Tariaso's article, like many of you in the room have already, Whose Culture Has Capital, a critical race theory discussion of community cultural wealth. And Dr. Yasso's work is rooted in CRT and emphasizes success over challenges and focuses on how BIPOC individuals and communities overcome these challenges. Uh, critical um, uh, CCW, Community Cultural Wealth, is about us as faculty, staff, students, and administrators understanding the mechanisms of success for our students of color, our BIPOC communities in the classroom and society at large. So when I say for us, it's about us understanding success, one of the ways we go about doing that is instead of asking questions like, why do so many black males leave post-secondary education? We might wanna have a reframe and say, 
So why black males, so how do, or why do black males persist in post-secondary education despite all their known barriers, right? So why do black males persist in post-secondary education despite all known barriers is a, um, is a, 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 a um, accomplishment type of question as opposed to asking why do so many black students leave post-secondary education, which is a deficit prompt. And finally, uh, the last article we read was Franklin um, VP's Introduction to Cultural Capital in the African American and, and African American Education. And in this article, it examined the role African Americans have in providing financial and other material resources for support of public and private schools that are often in the black and brown communities. And what it looked like is looked at is how over the last three decades, there have been regular reports in books and magazines and newspaper articles describing the precarious financial conditions for uh, urban public schools systems with the majority of African-American and other non-white student populations um, not receiving uh, equitable funding. So this was a really um, helpful article. Next slide, Sharon. So our dialogue and discussion centered on what actions we were going to take to dismantle inequities in our classes, workshops, and counseling. So a couple of um, um, highlights that came out of those discussions. So for example, the redesign of class activities. So one of the counselors, I'm not gonna call out names, redesigned a classroom activity for his HDC 103 class. And according to the counselor, after these deep, these readings and deep reflective conversations with his counseling colleagues, he has changed some of his class exercises. For example, he will now be comparing the exercise of a privileged walk to a community cultural wealth walk. And with the outcome of helping students highlight the harm systems of, of evalu evaluation can produce and question of how they inform what future folks are working towards. Another one was a uh, counselor um, incorporated more qualitative narrative approaches to assessment that highlight cultural wealth. So Dr. Smith, Brian Smith says, after these count conversation, he now includes some of the articles that we read in his HDC 102 course with the module having to do with introduction to American universities. According to Dr. Smith, students will give uh, well, this will give students the needed alternate alternative readings of the liberal construct of the triumph of the American university. According to Brian, with respect to his HDC 100 career planning and personal evaluation class, Brian stated that he is better attuned to a critical perspective on a trait psychology psychometric, doesn't that sound like a doctor, assessment models of career psychology, and also he will now include more qualitative narrative approaches to assessment that highlight cultural wealth, taken right from CRT's tenet of counter storytelling. Uh, Ruby designed a un new unit on CRT, understanding power, building trust between providers and patients. And the goal of this was this uh, to what of this class was to transform the relationship between race, racism, and power. And she incorporated each tenet of CRT and worked with her students in the allied health program. She taught this to the students in allied health and um, wanted them to expand on sections or she wanted to expand on sections on microaggressions and intersectionality to help those students deepen their understanding um, in healthcare and their understanding of how uh, race and racism affects not just them as students, but also the clients that they, the patients that they provide. And for me, the discussion and dialogue that we had around race and equity has informed a rewording of my uh, course description for my AME to a one class. And the descript my description is now more explicit and makes clear the objectives and outcomes for the class, which conceptualizes com community cultural wealth as a critical race theory. So, um, you know, we had some reflections going on as well, but for the sake of time, I just wanna wrap up. I think the one reflection that I'll give is just Ruby's reflection and her wrap up was, uh, um, 
this was a the wonderful unintended consequence of coming together and using uh, the uh, Seattle Central's framework for um, uh, to discuss race and racism was the unintended consequence of this activity was the authentic team building. This was especially welcome as building relationship with our colleagues became harder with COVID and working from home measures. And she says, I was grateful for these deep, meaningful conversations that help our team connect and get to know each other in a heartfelt way. And with that, I'm going to um, pass the torch. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I interrupt for a minute? Uh, so it is 1.50 and I don't know if you all saw the chat message from Michaela. Um, so the presentation is going to go beyond 150. So we're going to take a quick pause if people want to go to the other workshops, but uh, the BSTT will continue here. And Michaela says, thank you all for your understanding and flexibility. And Should I start? I always get stage fright. Uh, I get the butterflies before I teach. So the less people, the better. Uh, I'm just going to watch that number drop. Uh, all right, uh, I wanted to show an example of work that faculty have taken on their own initiative that is anti-racist, curricular, institutionalization, et cetera. Uh, I'm mostly going to read. I'm going to try to do it rather slow. Um, but because I'm in composition faculty, I wanted to show some concrete examples of what this kind of work looks like on the ground. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a collaborative project undertaken by faculty in library and in English uh, on their own initiative as an example of what it looks like when workers take on anti-racist work as everybody's business. Um, altogether, this represents the work of over a dozen faculty members. And for the record, I had nothing to do with it uh, besides cheerleading from the sidelines, but I'm really excited about what they've been doing. And it's an amazing example of how workers can work collectively to institutionalize the work that we know is important. Uh, next slide, please. So for a little background, over the last year and a half, year, two years, I'm not sure of the timeline. I don't know time anymore. A team of faculty from all three colleges worked on revising district-wide English 102 outcomes to center equity and anti-racism into the course outlines. Um, together, they revised the outcomes to focus on centering marginalized voices, interrogating how power and authority work in research and sources, and also to center student inquiry uh, rather than just simply uh, gathering and repeating information. So simultaneously, uh, next slide please. Simultaneously, a number of us in English had been reading and thinking about a project put together by a collective of black feminists, uh, black feminist scholars, activists uh, called Cite Black Women, which calls on academics to disrupt the canon, upturn the erasures of history and give credit where credit is due. Uh, next slide please. The Site Black Women Collective put together a whole movement, which includes a website, a podcast, a manifesto, uh, next slide please for the manifesto, which not only details the history of erasure that they mention, but also um, outlines their whole praxis. It's a great statement. I have my students read it in 102. Um, so as you probably know, English 102 involves research-based writing, and that includes teaching citation practices. So inspired, so since inspired by cite black women, English faculty members were thinking about the ethics and pedagogy of citation, we ended up with outcomes like this. Next slide. Understand how power shapes which sources and voices are amplified and how to rebalance power by incorporating marginalized sources and voices into students' compositions. Now, I know we're in a difficult moment as workers in this institution, but seriously, when I show this outcome to friends at other institutions, their jaws hit the floor. No one gets to do this kind of stuff at their work at other institutions. And I say that because I know we feel really ground down right now, but it's important to remember our collective power and joy as educators and faculty workers and what we get to do when we're working together. 
Uh, we get to do stuff at Central that no one else gets to do, which is part of why thinking and talking about this project gets me so excited. Uh, so now we have these outcomes for a class that is a requirement for a majority of transfer students and many prof tech students as well, right? I, I was gonna make up a number of how many students have to take English 102, but it was gonna be a lot and I will not, I don't, I don't have a source to cite. So a lot of students take English 102. Um, it's almost universal, right? So meanwhile, another group of faculty from English and library put together, uh, there was a, this came out of another brick, right? Which was uh, a site black women module. Uh, next slide, please to show what this site black women praxis would look like in the classroom. Uh, so they put together lesson plans, resources, and materials that would center anti-racist work rather than do a cleanup job through an equity lens once things are done, you know what I'm saying? So it, they would start, start from the praxis rather than check it at the end. Um, so this is just a, this is part of the module that they built. Uh, this is internal at, on English and it has like, uh, Sharon, could you do the next slide? It's the librarian's lesson plans. If you've ever, oh, it's, you can't read it. But anyway, the librarian's lesson plans are always very tidy and very awesome. Um, so it's got lesson plans, it's got videos, it's got assignments, um, all of the ways in which different faculty members have like kind of taken this project and put it into their classrooms. Um, so now we have the theory piece the curricular piece and the classroom piece, right? And then we also have the unsexiest but kind of weirdly exciting piece of all, which is the assessment piece, right? So in English, we were tasked with uh, uh, developing uh, an assessment project to identify one of the new outcomes to measure uh, by the end of the year. So guess which outcome is getting assessed, right? Next slide. Oh wait, no, I didn't put that in. It's the old one with the circle. Yeah, that one. That's the, so we're measuring this outcome in every English 102 class um, and seeing and helping our students achieve it, right? Uh, which is our jobs. Uh, so that's it for me. I know we're running out of time. We have run out of time. Um, I'm gonna put this, the last here is the shout out to all the faculty who worked on this project. And it also includes all English faculty who are teaching English 102. Um, thank you. I'm gonna put the link to Site Black Women in the chat again. Great. Thanks, hard to follow um, all of these hard acts. Elena, you're so great, even though you say you get stage fright. That was awesome. Um, so thanks to all the diehard fans who are still in the room. Um, I'm Kate Krieg and work on Guided Pathways at the college. And I can't overstate how important it was that Dr. McRae and Elena formed the BSTT to ensure that Guided Pathways um, is grounded in equity and an identity framework. And other colleges admire what we've done and are trying to replicate some of our work. And I'm incredibly proud of its influence on Guided Pathways. Um, guided Pathways was not focused on equity in what I call Guided Pathways 1.0. Um, in fact, back in the day, I spearheaded a report for the district that said um, Guided Pathways wasn't going to fly because it wasn't centered in equity. Um, so I get the skepticism and we wouldn't be central without the skepticism um, when you and we have seen so many one-off initiatives or funding that at its best doesn't make an impact or at worst harms our most marginalized or minoritized students. I would say guided pathways can be a movement that moves away from one-off initiatives and silo busts and infuses equity and is sustained as Sharon said, um, partly because I'm seeing it, but I also think that it will only continue if people continue to stay involved or get involved and influence its implementation like the STT has. Um, as you heard Dr. Yoshiko say this morning, we have arrived at Guided Pathways 2.0 and to help us make that a reality, the BSTT and student voices work is the foundation of Guided Pathways. Um, I see BSTT's framework as our compass for guided pathways work and needing to infuse all of our work. 
the BSTT mission that Sharon showed at the beginning of this presentation very much aligns with the guided pathways um, principle that this work requires urgent radical transformational change that engages employees and students in systemic lasting change. Um, so at Central specifically, how are we walking the walk? A la Paul Gorski. Um, next slide, please. Well, first, thank you to the 11 work groups on campus or about 50 employees who are using the BSTT framework to center racial equity in dialogue and decision making to guide their thinking and approach and implementation of any changes. Um, and more than 20 additional employees have been exposed to the framework through the mapping project. And this doesn't even include employees um, who have experienced the approach in the framework through accreditation or CCC plus work or other work like you've heard mentioned. So I wanted to just give a couple of examples about how the um, how folks are using the BSTT framework in the work. Um, so in the mapping project, all the departments that have participated have been exposed to the frameworks approach when they've looked at their course and program data. Um, we give the group some initial questions from the framework to think about when they're looking at course and program data. Um, and then after each group is prevented, uh, presented the full approach and mapping leads facilitate some discussion to help people practice thinking through the mindset of that. Um, the first year experience work group, um, one of the main tasks of this work group is to reimagine and revamp new student orientation from concept to implementation. And this group read Payne Geraldo's article, The Role of Critical Race Theory in Education. Um, and then I introduced the framework once with the whole group and then more in depth with the leads at a separate time. And together we came up with a way for the group to start practicing the approach and embracing the mindset that comes along with that. And they're doing a really great job. They wanna start every meeting with the CRT tenants and eventually progress to having the tenants just automatically inform the decisions. And there's gonna be a shared document for brainstorming and sharing feedback from students. Um, particular, particularly for this group at this stage, they'll start focusing on the CRT tenants and looking at new student orientation website and how it aligns or doesn't with the tenants. And they're using the tenets of CRT for them to start discussing might be missing from the website. Um, and one of the questions in the framework that the group is starting with is what actions can we take to dismantle inequities at our institution through us reimagining and revamping new student orientation um, and the leads and the members um, just you could tell like after they were exposed to the framework, like a lot of groups that I've experienced and seen, there it generates discussion. And that's how this framework comes alive. Um, it's not something that is like a checklist. It's not a handbook. It's not a worksheet. Um, it comes to life when people wrestle with it um, and try it on and use it as a different approach so that we can break the status quo. Otherwise, we're just going to repeat what we have done in the past. And I guess I'll end by just saying that in the fall, the BSTT framework will be in the equity and practice module. So that's a canvas shell um, that everybody can have access to and you can um, watch and listen to a lot of the people that you've seen here, the panelists of the BSTT go through a sort of podcast, um, walking you through the framework in more depth. So that's really exciting. And it's the more in-depth rollout that you're seeing the preview for right now. So that's the goal for fall. And with that, um, I have the last, last slide. Um, so yes, so for fall, the expectation is that this will be rolling out and that we are going to expect that the campus become very familiar with it so that we begin to putting all of this into practice and what will that look like? So um, as a way of, of saying thank you and, and um, ending our session, we have a, a reflection for you to consider, um, to ponder, to reflect, um, and how does any of this resonate with your work, the work that you're already doing individually or collectively in your departments, in your areas, 
So how does it resonate? And secondly is, as we move uh, towards more transparency and transformation at our institution, what are some of the areas where this framework can guide us um, to walk the talk of racial equity and care? Um, one of the things that has been in my mind throughout our working on this is that we are here to not have a status quo. Um, and if there are things in your reflection that you can uh, send our way that can disrupt the way in which we do things so that we can do them differently, uh, so that this framework uh, is practiced and, um, and used and impacting the work that we do in the college as a whole, uh, please do share. Um, I thank the group. There's so many of us who've been involved uh, and we appreciate it. So. Um, Keep this in mind and I'll stop there and say thank you so very much from the Black Solidarity Think Tank. We've enjoyed doing the work and we definitely have had a lot of conversations around this and making it real. So, hey, who's next? Who would like to bring a push? I think that might be me. So thank you everyone. And thank you all so much for doing this. I think. This was such a great way to show what it looks like. And I was, um, I've been communicating with a colleague about, oh, we can do this and we can do that. And so we will be contacting you all <laughs> for more info. Um, and thank you everyone for being flexible and staying. Um, and so I think at this point, uh, people will just move to their, to their own workshops and we look forward to the podcast and everything else that's happening next year with the Black Solidarity Think Tank. Thank you.